price is off. Yep. You're looking good.
worship our Lord and lead me to the cross. That's what this service is about today. Lead me to the cross. Sing from your heart to the Lord, for he is worthy. Let's honor him today. Savior, I come. Him 
No, not religion, not a denomination, not a church, not a pastor, not a priest, not a bishop, not an elder. We want to make Christ known. I've never saved anyone from their sin, but the Lord Jesus Christ has saved untold millions, including many people sitting before me. And so today, this is about him, and I am very excited in working on the service throughout the week. I have a brief message before we enter into the communion time, but I want to begin by us singing this song together. Here we go, everybody. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. separation between a holy God and sinful man. 
And yes, Adam and Eve came to a point of breathing their last breath. Why do we die? It goes back to original sin. That's where sin came into the world. Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And then you look at the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, those sacrifices, and specifically let's talk about the lambs. Those lambs were sacrificed. They died. They were put to death. And those lambs were pointing toward the ultimate blood sacrifice. Remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He made sure we understood that Jesus was not just a sacrifice. He made sure we understood that Jesus was the supreme sacrifice. John the Baptist said this in reference to Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Thank God for that once and for all sacrifice that was made over 2,000 years ago. No more need for animal sacrifices. The cross reveals the wages of sin, but also on a positive note, the cross reveals the supreme evidence of the love of God. How much does God love you? How much does God love me? People sometimes ask the question, what has God done for me? Well, everything, right? He gave his son to die on a cross. God commendeth. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The whole Bible in one verse, John 3, 16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The whole Bible in one verse. How much does Jesus love you? How much does Jesus love me? He loves us enough to be stretched out on a cross. He loves us this much. Enough to be stretched out on the cross and for nails to be driven into his hands and into his feet. The cross reveals the supreme evidence of the love of God, immeasurable, unfathomable, indescribable. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. The love of God revealed at the cross. What does the cross provide? Let's talk about that for a few minutes. First of all, the cross provides redemption. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Redemption, the biblical concept of redemption, purchasing a slave for the purpose of setting them free. Concerning, concerning those in this room who know Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed, how? By the blood of Jesus, you have been purchased from the slave market of sin and set free not to do what you want to do but to do what you ought to do now because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the fact that you turned, turned to Christ in repentant faith calling upon Christ to save you you have been set free the Bible says before, before we were saved the Bible is very clear our righteousness, our good works Nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. We could not honor God. But now, because of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, and now because I put my faith and trust in Christ, I am a believer priest. Now I can honor God. Now I can glorify him. Now, even in this service, what I do can be a sweet-smelling savor in his nostrils. And it's because I've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The cross provides redemption. The cross also provides justification. <laughs> Romans 3.24, being justified freely. Don't you love the word freely? Being justified freely didn't cost me anything, didn't cost you anything, cost him everything. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justification, what does that mean? Simplistically, there's a lot that we could say. But simplistically, the act whereby God removed your sin. Isn't that awesome? As far as the east is, from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen? Amen? It's because of his death on the cross. 
Justification, just as if I never sinned. The act of God removing our sin. So something moved out at the age of 12 in Alexander City, Alabama, when I understood that I was a sinner. I understood that I could not save myself. I understood my only means of salvation was the one who, who was put to death over 2,000 years ago, and I called upon Jesus Christ to save me. I was justified. I was justified by the blood of Jesus and God. God justified me. The act of removing my sin. So the sin moved out but something else moved in. What moved in? Well, let's talk about that. The righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 9 the Bible says for by one man's disobedience many were made Sinners, talking about Adam, the representative head of the human race. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So as by the obedience of one, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. See, the Bible is very clear on this matter. Sin does not enter into heaven. Sin cannot enter into heaven. That puts us all into a predicament, does it not? Because we were all born sinners. No one had to teach me to do wrong. I knew how to do wrong by nature. This is not only biblical, it's also logical. I had to be taught to do right. I was born a sinner. And no amount of good works, reading the Bible and praying and giving, witnessing, preaching. I could preach all of my life and still not enter into heaven. For you see, none of my good works will erase all of the sin that I've committed in my life. The wrong things I've done. Things I've not done that I should have done. Sins of omission to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not in his sin. Sins of the mind. All of my good works. I'm doing a good work right now. But this good work is not going to erase any previous sin in this pastor's life. And no amount of good works that you do will erase any sin in your life. But the Bible teaches that when we trust Christ as Savior, we are justified in the act whereby God removes our sin. That moves out as far as the east is from the west. So far, he removed our transgressions from us. And then his righteousness moves in. The Bible speaks of this, the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the sin moved out. The righteousness of Christ moved in. God declared me righteous even though I was not righteous. So at the age of 12 when I called upon Jesus Christ to save me, I was justified the act whereby the sin moved out. The act of God, salvation's all of God. And then the righteousness of Christ was imputed to me. God no longer saw me standing in my sinful state. God saw me standing in the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm clothed with a garment right now which cannot be seen with the naked eye, but it certainly can be seen by God. It's called the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I may not look like much to you, but God says I'm very special. I'm clothed in the righteousness of His Son. Amen. And it's all because of what happened on that cross over 2,000 years ago. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, remember? When Adam and Eve sinned, remember? They tried to cover their nakedness, which is a picture of man trying to cover his sin. That was not sufficient. So what does the Bible teach us? The Bible teaches us that God clothed Adam and Eve in animal skins, which meant an animal had to die and blood had to be shed. Right in the book of Genesis, pointing to the ultimate blood sacrifice. And just as God made Adam and Eve appropriate, if you will, as far as their attire, at the moment of salvation, God clothed me in the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. And the same thing is true for everyone in this room. If you know Christ, the sin has moved out, the righteousness of Christ has moved in. 
God no longer sees you standing in your sinful state. God sees you standing in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why you will enter into heaven. Has nothing to do with the church. Has nothing to do with your good works. If we could work our way into heaven, why would Jesus have died on the cross? Has nothing to do with the denomination. Has nothing to do with religion. Has nothing to do with Billy Graham. Has nothing to do with his pastor. Has everything to do with the one who died over 2,000 years ago. We're justified by the blood of Christ. We are declared righteous. His righteousness imputed to us, placed to our account. And also peace. Adam and Eve, they had perfect fellowship once again before sin. Sin changed everything. Perfect fellowship with God. But at the moment of original sin, there was a separation once again between holy God and sinful man. Adam and Eve desperately needed someone or something to bridge the gap. They desperately needed that. See, Adam, the representative head of the human race. But Jesus is the second Adam. Did you know that? In Scripture, he's called the last Adam. In fact, we sing about it at Christmas. Second Adam from above, reinstate us by thy love. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Jesus, the second Adam, the head of the spiritual race. And you see, Adam and Eve, because of their sin, once again, there was a separation between sinful man, holy God. They desperately needed someone or something to bridge that gap. I'm here today to tell you, as pastor of this church, and by the authority of God's word, the cross of Jesus Christ is that which bridges the gap between sinful man and holy God. Yeah. It is because of his death we can be made at peace with God. Colossians 1 19 having made peace through the blood of his cross and to you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now hath he reconciled Colossians 1 19 and 20 Romans 5 and verse 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because of his death humanity can be reconciled to God humanity can be made at peace with God God. And then sanctification. You know what we're told in Hebrews 13 verse 12? That we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Sanctification. The idea is being set apart for a special purpose. As a believer in Jesus Christ, those in this room who trusted Christ as Savior, you have been set apart for a special purpose. What is that special purpose? Honoring and glorifying the God of heaven. The Bible says we are his peculiar in the King James. We are his peculiar, not meaning strange. We are his special people. And he has set us apart on this earth. And by the way, this old world needs people who love Jesus, who will show forth the light of Jesus Christ. We have been set aside, set apart for the honor and for the glory of God. Giving others a right opinion of God. How are we doing? How are we doing? That's the question to ask. The cross of Jesus Christ provides sanctification. But I love, I love what I'm about to say. I'm so excited to talk about this briefly. The cross of Jesus Christ provides access. For you see, in the Old Testament, they had the tabernacle and they had the temple. And in the tabernacle and the temple, you had two rooms. One room was called the holy place. In the holy place, you had the altar of incense. You had the table of showbread. You had the golden lampstand. And then you had this incredibly thick curtain. I hope you're watching the video. By the way, please watch those videos. Please do not be talking once the videos start because you miss a little sermon. Seriously, there was a sermon in that mini video. Some of you were watching that because it was talking about the veil, right? That separates or that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. An incredibly thick curtain, an incredibly thick veil. So what was behind that curtain? The Ark of the Covenant. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, the golden manna pot, Aaron's rod that budded. The mercy seat was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Then you had two cherubims facing each other. 
This is where the manifested presence of God was found. Only once a year, once a year, and only one person could enter into the Holy of Holies where God's manifested presence was found. Because man did not have access to God. You know what the Bible tells us? Look it up. Look it up when you go home today. Matthew 27, 50 and 51. Just to name two verses. Matthew 27, 50 and 51. The Bible tells us that the veil was rent from top to bottom. Signifying a new and a living way. You see, because of his death on the cross, that veil ripped from top to bottom, signifying a new and living way. Man now had direct access to God. You don't have to go through this pastor to get into the presence of God. You don't have to go through a priest to get into the presence of God. You don't have to go through any person on this earth. You can go directly into the presence of God through our great high priest, Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus, is not about religion. It's all about Jesus. We can go boldly to the throne of grace. Read, read, read the book of Hebrews. We can go boldly into the throne of grace. God invites us. Yes. Give him more praise. Give him praise today. Give him praise. It's because of him we have direct access to the God of heaven. This is not about religiosity. This is about Jesus Christ. Finally, glory, Revelation 7, 13, 14, 15, tells us that one day, on the other side, in heaven, the Bible tells us that we will serve our God day and night in the temple. And he will dwell with us eternally. Thank God for his spirit within us, the Holy Spirit. But can you imagine on the other side the manifested presence of God? You know, when it comes to heaven, we think about heaven, we have a lot of thoughts about heaven. and We think about the uh, majesty, the royalty, the bliss of heaven. I was sharing with the life group this morning at 9 o'clock that Jesus, who was a carpenter while he was on the earth, he said in John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house were many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus, who was a carpenter while he was on the earth, so that means he's the master carpenter, right? Yeah. Yeah. So for over 2,000 years, he's been working on a place that we will one day inhabit let that sink in. Can you imagine? And so we think about heaven. We think about the streets of gold and the royalty, the, the majesty of, of heaven, the Southern Gospel song that talks about the mansion on the other side. And we think about glorified bodies, no more aches, no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease, no more deterioration of the human body, no more death. Are you looking forward to that? Why? Revelation tells us, for the former things are passed away. And all of that's wonderful. I look forward to that. I look forward to the royalty, the majesty, the bliss of heaven. I look forward to the glorified body. I look forward to seeing my mother. I look forward to seeing my father. The countless funerals I've conducted in my 30 plus years of ministerial uh, service to the Lord. All the believers who are up there that I will see on the other side. What a great reunion that will be. But that's not the greatest thing about heaven. The greatest thing about heaven, we will look into the eyes of the one who shed his blood for us. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and he leads me through the promised land. What a day, what a glorious day that will be. Can you imagine living for eternity in the manifested presence and glory of God? Provided by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross over 2,000 years ago. Freely. Freely. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. The greatest gift ever given. Paul said it like this. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Sing with me. 
He's worthy, amen? amen? He's worthy. And this is about him. You may be seated. Today is different. We're not passing trays. We're doing things, still doing some things differently here at Bible Baptist Church. And so just in just a moment, the ushers will come directly to you. We're not going to pass any plates. There's plenty of room now that we have these seats separated as we do. There's plenty of room for them to bring the elements directly to you, and you will receive um, a little element kit, if you will. At the bottom is the bread. You just tear the bottom off, and you have the bread. Um, and then at the top, you tear that off, and you have the juice. So they'll only be serving you once as opposed to twice. We'll not be passing the plates. They'll be bringing it directly to you. You just reach in and, and take one. And also, the bread is gluten-free. I know that we have some people that's a concern for you as well. So the bread is, is gluten-free. But we just want to uh, love on Jesus. I've already loved on him. And I'm going to continue loving on the rest of, of this service because uh, where would I be without him? Where would I be without his salvation? So we just want to express love to him. This is not a religious exercise. It's not formality. It's not ritualism. No. It's a lot deeper than that. This is about a personal relationship that we have with our God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have open communion here. You do not have to be a part of this fellowship of believers. If there's been a time in your life when you've understood you were a sinner, you've understood that because of your sin you were separated from God, and that if you died in that state you would be eternally separated from God, and you've understood that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin, and you called upon him to save you, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. So if there's been a time in your life when you've called upon Christ to save you, and you've been welcomed into the family of God, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God. If you've been welcomed into that family, the family that I have entered into, I entered into it when I was 12 years old, you are more than welcome to participate. And I've been asking you throughout the month. We, we always let you know ahead of time because I wanted you to prepare yourself. And I hope that you came today prepared. The Bible is very clear about partaking unworthily and unconfessed sin in our lives or just in a frivolous matter, not, not considering the seriousness and the magnitude of the moment. This is a, a heavy moment. Those who know me well know that I love to have fun and cut up and I love all of that, but I also know when to be serious. And this is a time to be serious. This is a time of great magnitude, reflecting on his death. Father, I pray that you'll bless in the next few minutes as we partake of these elements and remember your death. And that's what it's all about, remembering your death, the once and for all sacrifice on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
this time I'd like to ask Tyson Graves to stand in voice of prayer of thanksgiving for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning as your people, united in the blood of Jesus Christ, here yes. with the Bull. To come here today, Lord, and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Lord, we can't be perfect and holy like you. It's only through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we have that hope of eternal life. And it's through that sacrifice, through the broken body and the shed blood, that we can experience salvation and that blessed hope of someday of being with you. Lord, prepare our hearts now as we get to take of these elements. We just pray that you would uh, help us to focus on you, Lord. That's what it's all about this morning. And your body and your blood. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. If you have prepared the bread, please go ahead and do that. You can take the wrapping off and prepare the bread. Please understand when you partake of this bread, it pictures a couple of things. First of all, when you place it in your mouth, it all in your 
break it. He pictures the broken body of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, the prophet prophesied that not a bone would be broken, but certainly his body was battered and bludgeoned. In fact, it says in Isaiah, his visage was marred more than any man. We cannot even fathom. We've seen movies, we've seen pictures, but we cannot even fathom how much Jesus suffered for us. So when you place it in your mouth and break it in your mouth. It pictures the broken body of Christ. But it also pictures the time that you receive the bread of life into your life. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He that I believe in me shall never hunger. He that believe in me shall never thirst. Um, so when you place this in your mouth, it pictures those two, those two things. The broken body of Christ and the day that you received the bread of life. The one who satisfies eternally in the spiritual realm. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. turn now to the blood if you've not already prepared the Jews please do that at this time we see the importance of the blood all the way through scriptures I mentioned in my message today when Adam and Eve sinned an animal was sacrificed blood was shed then they were clothed in animal Skins, we see the significance, the importance of the blood right there in the Garden of Eden. And then all the way through the Old Testament, especially in reference to the sacrifices, the blood sacrifices. Then we arrive in the New Testament, and what are we told? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Luke chapter 22 and verse 20. Reads likewise also the cup after supper saying. This cup. Is the new testament in my blood. Which is shed. For you. Father we are so blessed to be able to gather together today and to remember the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that what has taken place, what is taking place in this room would truly rise as a sweet-smelling savor to your nostrils. We're not here to be blessed. We're here to be a blessing. We want to bless the God of heaven. We want to tell you today, thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf. So Father, I pray as we continue on in this service that the praise, the worship might just continue to flow in this room. May it redound to your honor, to your glory. For you are worthy. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You know, Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me until I come. There's two things that will keep us on the right path in life. Remembering his death and remembering that he's coming back. That will keep us on the right path in life. Would you stand with me and let's sing, when I survey the wondrous cross with what a wonderful cross. Love this. Sing from your heart to the Lord. An old song arranged in a fresh way. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sing it with me now. When I survey, think about the words.
made my choice. I'm going to worship him. Not simply today, but going forward. Because he's worthy. You know what I love about communion here at Bible Baptist? We've been loving on Jesus, haven't we? This is what church is supposed to be. Do you feel like you've been in church? Yeah. It's not. It's not supposed to be just come and watch a show. No, it, it's it's about us gathering together and worshiping our Lord. For He's worthy. Please stand and sing the doxology. Sing it loud. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.